So what I'm going to do right now is uh, go through sort of I call it sort of a brief history of uh, innovation, invention, and discovery um, related to microbiology. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, not cover everything that that's happened, not cover you know all even of the most important things. Um, I'm going to try to pull out some things that are uh, relevant to the our course uh, in general, and some things that are interesting, and some things that are just um, particularly. Um, well-known at a certain time that you should you should also be aware of if you're not uh, aware of. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are not on, on this list uh, as well, um, but it's just going to be an overview of, of some of the major events. So kind of way back here, you know, we have some knowledge of human disease um, that is related to microorganisms, but humans don't really know anything about microorganisms. There are no microscopes, there no, there's no real scientific experimentation. Um, there is observation um, in other parts of the world where people see someone who is sick can make someone else sick and they know that something can be transferred, but that kind of largely goes ignored um, in most of Western civilization for a very long, long period of time. Um, so there are plagues and outbreaks and, and all these sorts of things that happen back in the 1300s and the 1400s uh, and 1500s. Once we start to get into the 1600s, we start to see um, the development of a microscope, which is really the beginning of our kind of modern age of the study of microorganisms, of small organs. We can't see them, so how do we study them? So the microscope is significant in that sense. Robert Hooke is often credited with um, developing the first microscope, but others developed um, telescopes long before he did and used that type of knowledge of optics to develop some sort of small tubular microscopes as well. Um, so he's not necessarily the first one to even come up with the idea, but he's the one credited with it partly because of this book he published called Micrographia. Micrographia was a book where he observed things through his small microscope that he developed uh, and then he drew the things that uh, he saw so he could share them with other people. Uh, and it's that kind of documenting, that scientific natural history documentation using this type of technology that made this event significant. So that's back around 1665. During that time, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who sometimes considered the father of the microscope, again, he did not develop the first one either, um, and he, he saw Hooke's micrographia that inspired him to then make a microscope of his own. So he develops a microscope that has much better resolution. So he improves greatly the resolution of the microscope and is the first to actually see bacteria. So he's the first to witness or see bacteria under the microscope and a large number of other things because he could see at that finer level of detail. So uh, Leeuwen Hoke is then, you know, often given credit for the, the really advancement of the microscope uh, at that time. Other people worked with the microscope as well. Um, even a person who will bring in a little bit later here, um, Joseph Lister, um, around just earlier before he did the work we're going to talk about up here, uh, Lister adds um, additional lenses to a type of microscope. Um, that then provides you know, even, even greater resolution and magnification and allows us to see even more. But that is happening um, in like the 1850s. And so we're talking about the, the 1650s. So we're talking 200 years before we really see any actual significant improvement in the microscope itself and the use of the microscope. What we're gonna see is then really over a hundred year gap where there's nothing that really happens with microscopy. Right? It's used more as a, um, an interesting observation, um, but nothing that's greatly tied to science or scientific discovery at the time. You can also see there's kind of a gap in here of, like, of any, you know, any particular points of discovery. Uh, again, that's because there really wasn't much of an advance or interest in, in science and pursuing those things. In addition, you see a lot here because we also then start to get some molecular aspects uh, that don't develop until much later. So we don't really discover the DNA and, and all these other things until gene sequencing until later on, which gives us relationships and identifying organisms and so on. 
Some significant things, though, that happened related to uh, microbiology around this time. That now, people have been sick for a long time. People saw how those diseases could potentially be passed on, didn't know how they were passed on. Um, and then, and through other cultures, um, people would uh, inoculate. So we call it inoculation. Uh, of someone who was sick, um, taking some of the materials from them and injecting it into a person who isn't sick, essentially to get them sick. Um, but getting them sick at a, at a much, much lower level um, so that they wouldn't uh, die. So what we have uh, around this time is smallpox. Uh, and in certain places, smallpox, could, uh, its lethality would range between 30 to 90 percent of people who were infected with smallpox would die, depending on the, the population of people. So... Um, it was one of the most deadly diseases, really, in, in all of history. Um, and at this time, there was a guy named Boylston who, in Boston, um, wanted to inoculate people uh, for smallpox by taking samples from the uh, people who were ill and injecting it into people who were healthy. Um, people didn't really like that, uh, thought it was insane to do that. But, and Benjamin Franklin, uh, at the time, was around, uh, thought it was a bad idea. Uh, but eventually he witnessed an experiment by Boylston. Um, so Benjamin Franklin saw the, how effective this could actually be. Uh, and he was an advisor to George Washington, who ultimately ordered uh, the entire uh, U.S. Army to be inoculated for smallpox around 1777. So this was essentially um, taking, uh, withdrawing with a needle samples from people who were sick, uh, from pus, and then injecting that into people who were healthy to inoculate them. And then they would become slightly ill for a while. Now, this is not a vaccination, which is going to come uh, a little bit later here. Um, and But we'll see um, the vaccine difference is, uh, this inoculation is just live organism. A vaccination is dead, is either the organism that's been killed, weakened, or it's antibodies or proteins from the pathogen that are then introduced into a healthy person. So it's not a, a healthy, live virus or bacteria that's being introduced with a vaccine. It's a dead organism or, or pieces of the organism that then your immune system can recognize and build up a, a defense against. Right? And that's what's happening here, but it's a little, it is more dangerous because they're being injected with the actual organism. So that's kind of what's going on through this time. Um, and in France, um, in uh, 1806, actually you have Napoleon ordering not just the army, but all French people to be inoculated against smallpox. So still the smallpox continuing here. Uh, and he's saying, let's, let's get everyone inoculated against smallpox um, to, to protect the entire population. So time kind of continues on and these sorts of things are happening where we're getting something like um, science happening with uh, these discoveries. Around 1838 is where uh, Schleiden and Schwann independently um, come up with the main part of cell theory. Uh, essentially that, that all living things are cells. Or, so either are cells, so single-celled organisms, or made up of cells. So multicellular organisms are made up of many, many, many cells. Single-celled organisms are just a single cell, but anything that's alive is a cell. Cells are the smallest unit of life. And so that idea, that concept, comes about now around 1838. Okay, so this is where people actually finally start to recognize, yes, you know, the, there are these things called cells. We could observe them now through the microscope. We have some advances in microscopy occurring at this time. Uh, and, and these people are then studying all different sorts of organisms and finding they all seem to be made up of these little small particles, which they can further break down. And these are 
attributing all the way back to Robert Hooke, uh, who actually came up with the name cell, um, observing cork. You know, so really it has that kind of, uh, you know, plant cells have cell, have cell walls. And so the cell wall structure looks like these tiny little rooms, you know, and so he, he thought that these little rooms or cells um, is where the name actually that comes from way back then. So that's just what well, now we know and moving forward as people start to study cells, we're focusing on the study of the, the bacterial cells, mostly, you know, in this particular course. But now all other types of cells, plant cells and animal cells, be, uh, become more of a topic of study and science and all those other areas starts to really expand. We have around this time some other things happening. We have germ theory all right, coming out. So the idea and Louis Pasteur, so Louis Pasteur, uh, is known for a number of things. So one of the things that he did uh, most significantly um, is sort of to disprove the idea of spontaneous generation. So a spontaneous generation, he disproved it. And this is essentially that you know, the, that um, things that spoil food just sort of come from nowhere. You know, that flies just come from rotting meat, that they don't come from fly larvae. Uh, they just come from the meat itself. Just somehow they're just they're just there. They just spontaneously appear because people would observe those sorts of things happening. Um, you know, molds and growing over things and, and flies and all these other things infesting things. And they just thought that's what they came from. He said, no, that's not, that's not true. These things are coming from other places that, that's actually contaminating them. And so this idea then of germ theory that, that is furthered, the idea that there are organisms, there are things. Now, in this case, there are cells that are going to be passed on, say, from one organism to another that are pathogens that can cause or spread disease or rot or decay, you know, plant materials and other, li other living things. Going along with it in this time, um, we get a man named Semmelweis, who is one of the first, really, to start to promote um, hand washing. So this is fairly significant for us, right, to think about. And I'm not talking about hand washing in, you know, when you're coming home or going to, after you go to a store, go into a bathroom. We're talking about hand washing by medical professionals doing surgery. So people would not take any type of aseptic procedures, uh, even when performing surgery on people who are ill. So often in medical schools, students would be um, in one area dissecting uh, dead bodies to study the anatomy, not wearing gloves or anything like that, just with their bare hands. Then they would move into the uh, surgical bay part of a hospital um, not doing anything, not putting on gloves, not cleaning their hands, and they would cut into people, put their hands in them to do things and suture them back up. There was no forethought that the reason all these people were dying after surgery was because they were in, being introduced, having organisms introduced into them that were then causing infection and killing them. So incredibly high numbers of infection. And Semmelweis said, I think this is crazy. We should actually try to clean uh, equipment. We should clean our hands and all people before performing the surgeries. And uh, he was actually um, laughed at. People fought um, him on this. And so in a hospital that he worked, he was able to instate this and say, we are going to start doing these things. Uh, and all of a sudden, the survival rates increase you know, like 90 percent, by enormous amounts um, from people dying after surgery to people surviving the surgery. Uh, and one of the main differences was uh, cleanliness, essentially uh, wa washing their hands. So people started to embrace this. Uh, Joseph Lister, who I said also um, advanced the microscope some as well, uh, started to, um, you know, like Listerine. So, so more types of disinfectants were things that he developed and also techniques for disinfecting uh, surgical equipment as well. So not just now the surgeon's hands, but the, the scalpels, the equipment, the, the rooms, everything that was uh, being done when a person who was being operated on um, was being exposed to uh, other people and the air that the, all those things should be clean of organisms that could cause uh, an infection because now we're they're embracing this idea of germ theory. that Because before that, no one knows, you know, they attribute things to 
mystical you know sources or you know, curses and all sorts of things that are not scientific or not testable you know by science um, and so finally this is sort of embraced uh, and as it is then people start to pay attention to it and take effect um, as we kind of move a little bit forward here again, there's a lot of a lot of things are actually happening during this time um, so we can't really get into um, to all of them um, we have Robert Koch did a number of things. Koch is one of the first to um, isolate then pathogenic organisms. And so he comes up with something called Koch's postulates. So Koch, and I have a whole other presentation on the Koch's postulates, you know, what they are. They're still used today. Essentially, uh, it's the idea that um, if a person is ill, something would be making them ill, some type of pathogenic organism, that you should be able to isolate the pathogenic organism um, from that person. And so he had to then develop techniques to grow organisms on plates in labs. So that was also the, the lab science of, it, of actually culturing bacteria on a plate. He was one of the first, there were others as well, people who developed the Petri dish and, and so forth, and, and the auger and the nutrient media. But Koch is really one of the first ones to, to push this and, and isolate some of the organisms causing disease, like co cholera. Uh, he was the first to uh, isolate and identify Vibrio cholera, um, as the agent that caused cholera. Uh, so he develops these stepwise procedures for uh, isolating the organism, then using it to infect healthy organisms to see if it actually causes the same disease, so using mice, not, not humans, um, and then being able to re-isolate the same organism from those individuals and check it against the original. Find out they're not sick now with something totally different. It's the same, same sort of thing. So other lab techniques had to be developed you know, during this time. So the, with the culture of organisms, the microscopy, staining techniques, and a variety of different things. So along with that, staining techniques, we get in 1884, uh, Christian Graham develops the Graham stain. So one of the major ways that we um, view bacteria uh, is staining them and then looking them under the microscope. One of the ways we tell the difference between two major categories of bacteria based on their cell wall is with the Gram stain, whether they have a Gram positive or Gram negative cell wall. And regardless of whether we're using uh, DNA sequencing to identify the bacteria or classify them or look at their relationships, uh, Gram type of cell wall, a Gram positive versus Gram negative cell wall, is still held as pretty much the highest level of classification. All the gram positives are genetically related, at least closer than they are to the gram negatives. And the gram negatives are more closely related to each other than they are to the gram positives. So, and that is a staining technique developed around 1884, which then allows people to, to see them and actually do a type of test to see what type of, of group that they fall into. And that's again, there's, we talk more about cell wall later and go into the technique of gram staining. We have a vaccine then developed for rabies also by Pasteur. So Pasteur kind of spans here. So he, he's the one who develops a, a vaccine for rabies around 1885. Um, and then we have um, a few years later uh, in uh, 1892, we have someone named um, Ivanovsky um, who, uh, sorry, I lost where, um, where I was on here. Um, there's something what year am I in? 1892. Sorry, I'm totally off on this. Um, I'll come back to this one here because I missed my notes and uh, I wanted to add something important I wanted to add in here and right now I'm totally forgetting it and uh, uh, I can't quite find it on, on, uh, on my note paper here. Around the same time though, a significant event uh, takes place. Uh, the Spanish flu occurs in eight, uh, 1918 to 1919 uh, time period. Um, so pretty much you know, doing this right now uh, in uh, 2020. So it's pretty much a, a hundred years uh, ago. Uh, and we have our uh, coronavirus, um, COVID-19 pandemic right now, Spanish flu, something very similar to that. Also, uh, if you read anything about it, or the history of it, you'll find sim similarities. Things like um, populations were required to wear masks when out in public. People fought against the wearing of masks in places where people refused to wear the mask. The, um, the flu spread. Large, large numbers of, of people died right, from the Spanish flu. Um, and the, the spread 
you know, was related to the response, you know, by the areas, by people who were taking the spread seriously, wearing masks and trying to prevent the spread of it. The um, number of infected people went down in other areas where people refused to do that. The spread continued and large numbers of those populations died. Um, and we kind of see uh, something similar with a different type of uh, viral infection now, um, but some of those same sort of uh, political aspects and patterns um, reoccurring even 100 years later. Uh, so kind of like the idea of why study history, because sometimes you could learn something from history, uh, and when you don't, history, they say, repeats itself. The same thing happened over and over again because people don't use the information we have from the past to take precautions for the future. Uh, they just ignore them and just hope they don't happen again. And then when they do, act all surprised uh, that some of these things sort of happen when uh, we've known about them for a very, very long time. Um, now around this time here, uh, 1928, we start to have uh, Alexander Fleming. He discovers penicillin. So uh, this is where a, a bacteria, not a virus, um, like the flu. Um, so our first real antibiotic that's used, penicillin is discovered almost by accident you know, in his lab, produced by a fungus um, that inhibits the growth of bacteria, uh, the Staph aureus bacteria. And then it's tested. But we find that it's not actually used in humans until 1941. So it really takes um, several years, over, over like 10, 12 years, before people actually start um, getting penicillin. Uh, as a type of medication for illnesses. One of the interesting things is kind of also tying into things that kind of happen uh, happen today as well. It started you know, really quite long ago. 1941 is when penicillin started being used to treat people for infection. By 1947, there were already um, Staph aureus that were resistant to penicillin. So antibiotic resistant bacteria um, were produced in that time. A few years later, um, 1960, okay, so about 10, 12 years later, uh, a new antibiotic is developed, methicillin. So methicillin is now the antibiotic that can be used to um, kill the antibiotic-resistant Staph aureus. One year later, 1961, we already have MRSA. So methicillin-resistant, this antibiotic-resistant, Staph aureus. So Staph aureus is part of your normal flora. It's part of your microbiome. It's, it's a, a bacteria that lives on your, your skin. Uh, it, it is part of you. It's, it's fine. But there are certain strains um, of Staph aureus that uh, cause infection um, and uh, produce certain chemicals that um, cause a type of pathogenesis. And so um, be treated with antibiotics, except through mutation and the picking up of antibiotic-resistant genes, um, now they're not treated by antibiotics, mostly because of the misuse of the antibiotics. Uh, when antibiotics are used, when they're not supposed to, when they're not used long enough, um, they, the bacteria then become resistant to them. They don't actually become resistant, just in the population. Some of them are and some of them aren't. Um, we're killing off the ones that are not resistant, but then the ones that are resistant hang around. And if we don't keep treating them with the antibiotic long enough, then they remain and then they multiply and then they spread and they spread those genes, you know, as well. So um, and now we still have these problems and people still are developing uh, new antibiotics today um, to try and treat some of these antibiotic resistant bacteria. And many, many, many more types of uh, bacteria have become more and more resistant uh, to antibiotics. <clears throat> 1950, so we're kind of coming back. So around this time, we kind of kind of missed uh, a little bit here. We have... Uh, Kind of two events happening really like in the same year, 1953. Uh, one is uh, Watson and Crick. I don't know if I publish, right? A lot of people put discover. Like a lot of people say, oh, DNA is discovered. That's not, no. DNA is discovered long, long before uh, Watson and Crick. Many other people worked on um the structure of DNA and contributed to the parts of it. Watson and Crick were not experimental biologists. They gained uh, on their own none of the knowledge um, that was used to figure out the structure of DNA. Um, people like Rosalind Franklin uh, were far more uh, important in actually finding out what was the structure of DNA. Um, 
Chargoff, who finds off the base pairing, you know, A's pair with T's and G's pair with C's, Linus Pauling, a number of other people contributed all sorts of parts of uh, understanding the structure, but could never get all the pieces to fit together properly. Watson and Crick would take all the information generated by all these other people's laboratory experiments and just kind of model it and process it. And so they're the ones who eventually came up with the correct model for DNA structure and then published on that in 1953. So now we know the structure of DNA. A few years later, it's able to be uh, verified that yes, that, that is the structure. And then um, we start to get gene sequencing that can happen you know, but later on, which we'll talk about in a minute. Same year, we have uh, Jonas Salk develops a vaccine for polio as well. So polio being a major um, problem like smallpox was, but now we have a vaccine for that. Um, so, so all through time, kind of we have from way back in the 1700s, this, they're not really a vaccine, but the idea, you know, of vaccination to help prevent spread of uh, disease. Uh, and we still have the development of new vaccines constantly ongoing. I have a vaccine for malaria here around the year 2000. So we kind of have all those, those important steps. Uh, 1977, I put this in here for Carl Woese, um coming up with an explanation for now how we classify living things. So uh, in our class, we study primarily bacteria, which is one domain of life. The second domain of life is called archaea. These are both prokaryotic cells. And then the third domain of life is the eukarya. That's the domain that we belong to, okay? The, one, the cells that have a nucleus. So bacteria and archaea are cells that do not have uh, nuclei in them, yet they are very different from one another. And some, a lot of times we think, oh, oh, they're very similar. They're both like, they're both bacterial cells, but they're not. Bacteria are their own group called a domain. Archaea, we'll talk about in this course, there's a number of things about differences and similarities between them. I, I have some lectures on them. Um, we find that in some ways, archaea are actually more closely related to the eukarya than they are to the bacteria, even though they're prokaryotic cells and like a nucleus. So there's other, other sorts of things going on there. Some of that kind of information is revealed as we study the, the genomes then of organisms. So in 1995 is when the first bacterial genome um, is sequenced. So the A, C, G, C from start to finish of the chromosome, most bacteria have a single chromosome. Uh, some have more, but most have a single one. Some have extra chromosomal DNA and plasmids, but the uh, genome uh, is sequenced in 1995, and now we can start to study more of that, that molecular aspect of genes and gene expression as we continue on through to today. Um, other things happening, you know, similar around this time, I kind of jump, jumping back and forth a little, um, microbiome, this is a, another very important thing happening. Um, 1981 is the year where people recognize um, and start to identify the sequence of events that leads to the colonization of a human um, by their microbiome. So these are, the again, the bacteria that live in your digestive tract, uh, the bacteria that live on your skin, uh, and the importance of them just really starts to become revealed. Uh, what we have really up to this point is a history of bacteria and virus being associated with disease, bad things. We call them, you know, bugs and germs, and, and they have these terms associated with it. We don't think of them as being good. Now, people have used them for things like fermentation to produce meat and, and beer and, and bread and all these other, and cheese and all these other things for centuries and centuries uh, past. Um, but as far as actually those organisms living in us or with us, that, that's only we've been mostly associated with, with negative things. The microbiome shows us how important the, these organisms are to us, how we really couldn't even live without them. We couldn't be very healthy without them. They protect us from disease. They make enzymes that help us digest things. They do all sorts of things for us uh, that, that we almost often can't do ourselves. And once we get to these genome analysis, we find how much um, bacterial gene expression is occurring in our bodies is far more than human gene expression that's occurring in our bodies and how important they actually are to us, how many human diseases are um, related to that. So, you know, go forward a few years, um, 2012, we find a specific link between bacteria that live in your gut, your, your intestines and, and stomach, and uh, things that happen to your brain. So behavior, mood, uh, hunger, all these sorts of things affected by bacteria. Uh, 
you know, in your gut, even the development of certain diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's related to these bacteria themselves and how you can actually feed these bacteria proper foods, things that you eat that we consider healthy, uh, help essentially the bacteria that help you grow better. Um, things that like high sugar foods uh, feed the bacteria that are bad, essentially the bacteria that do not help you, bacteria that potentially harm you and cause inflammation in your body. Um, and so how your diet can be linked to these things is not just those chemicals and your human cells. It's that these bacterial cells do all these other things and our diets affect them. Um, and so as we kind of go forward, what we, what we have here, 2010, you know, really starting around there, there's this enormous surge in studies of the human microbiome. There's still studies of disease and vaccine, vaccines and there's still gene sequencing and all these things happening. But the microbiome really takes off now um, as uh, a center of focus for next path, you know, in, in the study of microorganisms and human, uh, human biology, uh, especially from the, you know, the positive side, all the things now that they're doing for us. And you're not going to find a lot of this even in many textbooks because it really is just so new, such a new, new field of study, but a very important field of study. So there's uh, more timelines, you know, in your book um, and a whole bunch of other places. There's some lists and PowerPoints uh, presentations that I have, but this just gives you a, a little walkthrough, a breakdown of some things that I talk about in a whole number of other lectures in the course. Um, and uh, to give you some sense of uh, um, a timeline of events, of, uh, of things that have happened that kind of led us to some of the places where we are today. So uh, make sure you look, though, at some of those other uh, presentations and at some of those other um, PowerPoints that I have with the lists of, uh, of events in them as well.